Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim The speaker you are listening to is Imam Muhammad Asi Imam Asi is the leader of Muslims in the metropolitan Washington D.C. area He previously led the daily and Jumu'ah prayers inside the Islamic Center His speeches were inspiring, revolutionary and thought-provoking which eventually irritated and threatened the Middle East ambassadors who controlled the masjid. Finally, the Imam, his family, and other Muslims faithful to the cause of Islam were forced out into the streets. This khutbah originates from the sidewalk across the street from the Islamic Center, apparently under sea. الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا يهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم الحمد لله كما ينبغي لجلال وجهه وعظيم سلطانه الحمد لله يخرج الذين آمنوا من الظلمات إلى الدور ويهديهم صراطا مستقيما الحمد لله وإن يكفر الكافرون وإن يظلم الظالمون الحمد لله فالله وحده بهم محيط وعليهم قادر لا يعجزونه فإن نتوكل عليه نهدى إلى صراط مستقيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله رب واحد وإله واحد إليه المصير سمعنا وأطعنا غفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير وأشهد أن سيدنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله جاء بالحق جاء بالهدى جاء بالنور المبين ليخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور ويهديهم إلى العزيز الحميد ما يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا مضل له ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فلا هادي له ومن يعتصم بالله ومن يتوكل على الله 
ومن يؤب إلى الله فإن الله سميع قريب ومجيب أما بعد أيها المسلمون أيها المؤمنون committed Muslims as a continuation of our understanding of the guidance that has come to us from Allah a guidance that has its value and its meaning never to be irrelevant and never to be outdated as we continue to uncover the practical and the germane meaning of Allah's words and the Prophet's words we will follow up with the instructions the lessons the thoughts the ideas and the conclusions of the role that the Israelis the Jewish political presence in the Arabian Peninsula what it meant at that time and what by extension it means today as they occupy the Holy Land Their adversity to the Prophet is well stated in the history that unfolded in Al Medina and in Arabia. Even at the young age when the Prophet alayhi wa alihi salatu wassalam accompanied his uncle on a commercial journey north towards Syria when he was met by the monk Bahira And this Christian monk recognized in the Prophet the features and the character and the future. He advised the Prophet's uncle, Abu Talib, and told him in the language of our days, Take care of him. Be cautious in bringing him up and be guarded against the Jews, against Yahud. Because if they can detect in him his potential They will not withhold harm coming his way from their quarters. And this monk continued and said to the uncle's prophet that this person shall have فَسَيَكُونُ لَهُ شَأْنٌ عَظِيمٌ He will have a distinguished future 
He will have a remarkable advent. From that early time, throughout the details that we tried to delve into in the previous khutbahs, to the dismantling of the Jewish, Yehudi, political and autonomous presence in al Medina, even though they had signed an agreement with the Prophet and we saw how faction by faction of Yehud the three factions, the three sectors of Yehud in al Medina betrayed their agreement and their signature. Let us take a look into the Yehudi mind as it was working in its final stand in Al Medina. When Banu Quraiza in the Muslim hour of duress when the Muslims were under siege in Al Medina, 10,000 and on other accounts more than that of the Mushriks had encircled Al Medina militarily. And inside Al Medina there was one Yehudi segment one Yehudi faction, one Jewish faction that was left. left. That was Banu Quraiza. When they finally realized that they could not deliver on their position in Al Medina to help those who are on the outside of Al Medina so as to cause a military routing of the Muslims by the Mushriks from the outside and by the, these Yahud and the Munafiqs inside of Al Medina. In that hour of, recogni of recognition, when they recognize when Banu Quraiza, the last or the remaining Jewish faction in Al Medina, recognized that now they had to face justice, that soon, in a day or two, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Islamic reality, the Islamic government, the Islamic state, the Islamic authority in Al Medina is going to catch up with them. What were their internal thoughts? Here they are in the middle of an Islamic state. Their cohorts and their co-religionists had betrayed the Prophet twice in the previous couple of years or so. And now they also stand in, or potentially they saw themselves standing in a court of law answering to why they betrayed the Prophet. Before that happened, what, what were, how were they discussing this affair among themselves? Their leader, Kaab ibn Asad, brought, called a meeting of this Jewish, of this leftover Jewish community, and he said, you are aware of the position that we are in now. Meaning we betrayed Muhammad and the authority of the Islamic authority of al Medina. What do we do? Here are the options, he told them. 
Ka'ab ibn Asad, their leader, told Bani Quraidha, his congregation, or his community, he told them, we have three choices. Our first choice is, we by now have come to recognize and realize that this prophet is for real. So why don't we just believe in him? Why don't we declare our Islam and verbalize a shahada? That's a way out. That's one option. What do you think about that? They told him, لا نفارق التوراة أبدا We will never part with the Torah. Meaning we don't want that option. We don't want to become Muslims. We don't want to endorse Muhammad. So he says, well, our second option is, listen to this, listen to the Yahudi mind and how they think. He said, our second option is, we kill our children and our women. We meaning the men. The men of Bani Quraidha, who were about 700 or so. We'll kill our families, the young ones and our women. And then we'll take a final stand, a military stand against the Muslims. Against Muhammad and his military force. This is the Masada complex. This is how deep down inside of them they cannot see themselves living a life of equality and a life of justice with those around them. In this case with the Muslims. So this was one of their options. They wanted to kill children and women, their own children and women, and then go on a mass suicide of a military encounter against the growing Islamic force in al Medina, which they felt through day-to-day experience, from year to year, they felt and they knew that this was the growing force of Islam. And the Prophet was there, was not there to diminish. He was there to grow and to spread and to flourish. So, what was the response? These Yahudis, the hundreds of them who were listening, they said, no, life is no good without our young ones, without our women, without our families. It's not worth it, in other words. So, this Yahudi leader in al Medina. Kaab ibn Asad told Bani Quraidha of the third option. He said, we are meeting here on the night of the Sabbath. That's Friday evening. When sun goes down and Saturday begins by sunset on Friday. He was conducting this discussion at that time. He said to them, we have just entered the Sabbath. And look at, look, listen to this Yahudi mind speaking to his co-religionists. He said, we know how the Muslims respect our religion, our rituals, and our rights. And being that this is the Sabbath, they know that we don't conduct any activity on the Sabbath. Much less, they are almost sure that we will not launch any war against them at this time. So, why don't we take advantage of this and launch a surprise attack against the Muslims on the Sabbath? And they said, no. We are not going to set ourselves up for being condemned by God for violating the Sabbath and then probably facing the wrath of the Muslims as 
They have been growing militarily throughout this time and the odds are against us. So if we're going to lose, we're not going to lose by defiling or violating the Sabbath. These were their internal thoughts. Either they become Muslims, which they didn't want to, to avoid the justice of return, because these were war criminals. Bani Quraiza in al Medina, in those hours of warfare, and they declared war by all of Arabia against the nascent Islamic State in al Medina was grand warfare. And the Yahud had agreed with the Prophet that they would not betray him. And they did. So they knew they were war criminals, and the only way out of the, the punishment that is due to war criminals is, in their mind, as their discussion had it, either they become Muslim, which they didn't want to do, or they kill their women and children and have another Masada in Medina, which they didn't want to do, or their final option was to take advantage of the Sabbath and launch a surprise military attack from within Medina against the Muslims, hoping that the mushriks on the outside would come to their rescue and finally collapse this whole affair of Islam in al Medina, which they were not able to do anyway. So, they agreed to arbitrate this affair. They turned down their choices. What was left to them is to seek the mercy of the Prophet, to ask him for clemency, for amnesty, for pardon, whatever it may come from him, they were willing to accept. And the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, consulted with those who were familiar for many years in their lives because of their residency in al Medina. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh and Sa'ad ibn Ubadah consulted with them. What should we do with these traitors, with these war criminals? And he did that quickly. He didn't cause time to elapse. He took on Bani Quraiza in the heat of the moment. مَنْ كَانَ سَامِعًا مُطِيعًا فَلَا يُصَلِّيَنَّ الْعَصْرَ إِلَّا فِي بَنِي قُرَيْضَ This sentence that the Prophet said is quoted many times by ritualistic Muslims, by detached Muslims, who says, in this hadith the Prophet says, whoever hears and whoever obeys should not pray his asr except at Bani Qurayza. And they use this as a fiqhi rule for the legitimacy of differences of opinion. Either you literally take what the Prophet says and you pray al-asr when you arrive in the neighborhood of Bani Qurayza which was in the southern part of al Medina, or you understand the Prophet post literally, which means that was an indication you should hurry up. You should hasten to go to Bani Quraidah and you can pray Al-Asr on your way there, not necessarily when you arrive there. This is how the fiqhi mind dwells on this sentence of the Prophet. But there's no Islamic political mind to dwell on seeking justice in the heat of the moment. Before Bani Quraidah are able to instigate other plots against the Muslims. Go to them immediately. The Prophet, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, summon the two Sa'ds, Sa'd ibn Mu'adh and Sa'd ibn Ubadah. And he consulted with them because they were familiar with these Yahud of al Medina. What should we do with them? And Sa'd ibn Mu'adh was suffering. He was in a sense on his deathbed because of the injuries he had sustained. And because he was closest to them in days and years previous to Islam, he went to them 
And he told them, do you know that you are war criminals? You are traitors. You have committed high treason. And they said, yes. But we ask the Prophet to pardon us. And he says, the only justice that can be done to you, and this is in context, Remember what the other two Jewish factions of al Medina did. He told them, It is only right that your warriors be put to the sword. Or, in today's language, be executed. 700 men, 700 Jewish men in al Medina were, were, were killed by the Islamic State as a matter of justice. We don't have any Yahudis coming around and saying that there was a miniature holocaust in al Medina because they know that's justice. We're not here about... We're not bringing up the issue of race. The Arabian race is better than the Hebrew race. Or the Arabs are chosen and the Hebrews are unchosen. That wasn't the matter of discussion. That wasn't the mentality. Those were not the values or the standards of Islam and the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you would ask, well, why don't the Jews bring this issue up? Why are they going to bring it up? There's nothing to be proud of. What are they going to say? We were traitors at the time of war. We wanted to stab the Muslims in the back. So they want to bury this part of history. They want to throw it down the memory hole. We can understand why they want to get rid of it. Because it's a blot in their history. But why? Have we gotten rid of it? Why isn't this current information in every Muslim's mind? Why don't you know these details? And why is it that when a Muslim presents these details to it, it only takes a short time and then they are once again erased away? Because there is no minbar in the masjid to sustain this type of information. There is no mainstreaming of khutbahs, of sermons, of teachings, of public presentations that will sustain this type of information. And so it becomes easy and convenient to forget. And this is where the average Muslim is. And the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after ending he told the Jewish women and children you may leave. And they did. And most of them joined the other Yahudis who had already left al Medina. And most of them concentrated their presence in Khaybar. That was a Jewish city in the northern parts of Arabia. They went there. But not the men. The men faced divine justice. And divine justice was, was the death sentence. And included among those who were executed was the head of this Yahudi clan, Ka'ab ibn Asad. And the head of Banu Nadir, who had come from Khaybar to coordinate this grand alliance against the Islamic State. Huyay ibn Akhtar. There were trenches that were dug up to be the graves of these Yahudi traitors. And this is a part of Islamic history. 
that should be as clear as sunlight to every Muslim mind. Which brings us to another area that has been unclear in the Muslim mind even after more than a thousand and four hundred years. Anyone here is challenged to go to the Islamic references and try to point out for us what the nature of relationships were between the Jews in al Medina and the Mushriks in Mecca before the Prophet was forced to leave Mecca. It seems like there is an official or a historical silence on this relationship. And that defies logic, common sense, and the nature of things. If there is a hostility of mushriks against the Prophet in Mecca, and the Jews were aware that there is the potential of Islam growing out of Mecca, they would find common purpose with these mushriks in Mecca, especially when we know that every year Mecca was an, a commercial attraction for all of Arabia. Souq Uqab is very well known in the history of those times. And what is also very well known is that heading the commercialism of Arabia were the Yahud in al Medina. So at least they used to go, their main merchants in those years, 13 years of the Prophet's presence in Mecca, trying to promote Islam. They came into contact with his message and what he was all about. And to try to come and tell or convince any Muslim that the Mushriks in Mecca were on Mars and the Yahud in Medina were on Venus, smacks of foolishness and ignorance. There must have been some type of communication going on during that period. And what is startling is that information is not available to you or to me now. Which is a comment on the type of history that we have inherited. So now the, the Yahud, these Jews no longer have a community or an autonomous presence in al Medina. Individuals, yes. From time to time there were Yahudis in and out of al Medina. And there was nothing wrong with that, as long as they weren't traitors, and as long as they didn't want a political presence there, which they knew by now they no longer had a chance to acquire. What was left was the Yahudi presence in Khaybar. And the Muslims, with the Prophet's leadership, remember in context, after Al-Khandaq, after the siege of al Medina, and after those three to four weeks of this military campaign to try to boycott, to embargo, and to place Medina under this military siege. They were not successful. After that, the Prophet signed what is known as the ceasefire of al Hudaybiyah. There were no longer live hostilities between al Medina, the Islamic State, and Mecca, the Kafir State. With all the reservations that we have presented about this, after this was done, the Muslims were not sitting back counting their laurels. The Muslims were once again on a military front, and this time this military front was against the Jewish concentration in Khaybar. So the Prophet began to try to loosen the alliance 
or the alliances that these Jews had in Khaybar with the other power centers in Arabia. Ghatafan, which is in Najd, and the other roaming tribes in the area. And he put together a force of dedicated Muslims, a thousand and four hundred. And at this time, they had about two hundred mounts. Unlike before, when they were lack, lacking any substantial amount of transportation. And they go to Khaybar. And they lay siege on Khaybar. Khaybar had, according to some reports in our history, had about 10,000 inhabitants. It wasn't a small place. In the terms of those days, 10,000 was a significant presence, urban presence in the peninsula. And most of them were these Jews that no longer lived in al Medina and who had agitated in a grand war against the Muslims in al Medina. Now it was their time. And after the Prophet laid siege, you see, this is the Yahudi Mushrik tactic. In Mecca, throughout 13 years, they realize, after 13 years, the mushriks realized that they could not destabilize Muhammad وسلم, as long as they were working at cross purposes with him. There was tribal factionalism, there was internal feuding, and all of this gave an area or an air of expression to the Prophet's message. So finally, they realized we have to all agree to shed this person's blood. That was the mushrik scheme in Mecca to get rid of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. That same scheme was applied on a larger scale in al Medina. The tribes of Arabia finally understood that the only way to get rid of Muhammad وسلم, was to close ranks and come to al Medina to defeat him there in his newly found state. But just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rescued him from the mushrik's closing rank in Mecca to assassinate him personally. He rescued him also from the tribes of Arabia coalescing around in Medina to defeat him or liquidate him militarily. And after that, Allah's Prophet was not distracted. He knew who these Yahud were. In Uhud, when there was a reversal of fortune for the Muslims or as some historians would say a defeat for the Muslims there some of the Ansar said ask the Prophet why don't we seek the help of Yahud and the Prophet said لا حاجة لنا بيهود we have no need for Yahud even though we know the nature of what war, especially when you feel like you're defeated. Practically speaking, you may say it is strategic or it is tactical. You may say it is pragmatic. You may say it is for survival purposes that we enter into this alliance with Yahud to militarily defeat those who came to Mecca and defeated us at Uhud. But do these types of prophetic quotes or statements reverberate in the mature minds of Muslims today? Regrettably, the answer is no. Who is the Muslim leader who stands out today and says, لا حاجة لنا اليوم بيهود? To the contrary, all of them are saying, 
We are in need of Israel. We are in need of Zionists. We are in need of Jews. If they don't say this verbally, they are saying it by their policies and their decisions. Finally, when the Prophet put together this force and arrived at Khaybar, and he began a new form of warfare by distracting the defenses of Khaybar on the different outskirts and concentrating on one area the military offensive on one area so that there will be a breakthrough and the Muslims may enter triumphantly into Khaybar and they did and the Prophet of Allah said Allahu Akbar Karibat Khaybar Inna ida nazalna bisahati qawmin fasa'a sabahu al-munzareen Allah is greater Allah is superior Today there's another Allah so to speak They have superpowers Even though they say Allahu Akbar they don't mean it Their God is the superpower Ask these rulers in our land who in Ramadan at Eid time in their daily prayers they say Allahu Akbar and they are lying because in their hearts they don't believe Allah is Akbar Allah is superior Allah is super there's another power that is super it is called the superpower. This wasn't the attitude. It wasn't the mentality of the Prophet and the Muslims when they arrived at Khaybar. Allahu Akbar. Kharibat Khaybar. Khaybar is destroyed. Khaybar is ruined. Inna idha nazalna bi sahati qawmin fasa'a sabahu al if we enter into the domain of a people, then woe is the beginning of their days. And finally, Khaybar surrendered. Remember, Al Hudaybiyah was in the background, a ten year conditional, itemized ceasefire, not a peace agreement. Now we don't have enough courage for Muslims to think about ceasefire. They want to jump to the Yahudi end and they want peace agreements. Where in the Quran or the Sunnah are there any foundations for peace agreements? How dare a Muslim think about peace agreements when Muslim blood flows from Central Asia to Southern Africa, from Northern Africa, to Eastern Asia. How can anyone think about peace agreements? Especially when it is on Yahudi terms. It is the lack of being assimilated into the Quran and into the Sunnah that renders Muslims directionless that renders the khutbahs in the masjids meaningless and that, that, is, and that has made it possible for people who are armed to spill Muslim blood and for Muslims to react to that in the ways they do back to the Quran and back to the Prophet away from reaction take the lead and march to the destiny that is outlined by Allah إما النصر وإما الشهادة أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم أدعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله إن الله هو التواب الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله بالمحامد كلها على النعم كلها
أسبغ عليكم نعمة ظاهرة وباطنة وإن تعدوا نعمة الله لا تحصوها We thank Allah We thank Allah for having extended to us out of his love and mercy and grace the guidance and the instructions that we are at fault for not understanding we thank him for the condition that we find ourselves in for we have brought it upon ourselves to be where we are today it is not because any there is any fault in Allah's words or any discrepancies in his scripture or any ambiguities about his prophets that we have failed to understand and to mold the type of behavior that is standardized by the Qur'an and by the Prophet. No Muslim has an excuse to shed any military determination in the type of world that we are living in. It's not going to be up to air-conditioned Muslims or Hollywood Muslims or Americanized Muslims materialistic Muslims to carry the responsibility of the day If graduating with degrees is capable of bringing about the desired Islamic state of affairs that you and I know of, then the Prophet would have been interested in establishing educational institutions and acquiring the technologies of the civilized world or the modernized world of the times of that time it takes a reliance upon Allah and next week we will begin a month of dedication a month of observance in which we are conscientized of Allah we want to gain the rewards and the blessings of this coming month of Ramadan with an open mind that hasn't been misappropriated by Allah's enemies we want to live this month with a free spirit that hasn't been damaged and crippled by Allah's enemies. We see Muslims, their bodies are very attractive or impressive. Impressive. تُعْجِبُكَ أَجْسَامُهُمْ But when it comes to these facts of life they run away from their responsibilities they are not even man enough to relate to their brethren thousands of miles away in Chechnya in the Balkans in the Indian subcontinent in Southeast Asia in the Middle East throughout all of Africa they can't relate to them through the word of truth on the street here in Washington DC they prefer to be within a comfortable setting 
where the weather doesn't bother their bodies and the word of truth doesn't bother their conscience. That's where they prefer to be. And that is why, as a sample or an example, we have what is coming our way. It will take more of the same to have us become the new generation that we are supposed to be. اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ولا تجعله ملتبسا علينا واجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم إليك نشكو ضعف قوتنا وقلة حيلتنا وهوانا على الناس يا أرحم الراحمين أنت ربنا وأنت رب المستضعفين فإلى من تكلنا إلى غريب يتجهمنا أم إلى عدو ملكته أمرنا إن لم يكن بك علينا غضب فلا نبالي ولكن عافيتك هي أوسع لنا نعود بنور وجهك الذي أشرقت له الظلمات وصلح عليه أمر الدنيا والآخرة من أن تنزل بنا غضبك أو تحل علينا سخطك لك العتبة حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بك اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم وبارك على محمد وآل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خذي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمركم أن تؤدوا الأمانات إلى أهلها وإذا حكمتم بين الناس أن تحكموا بالعدل إن الله نعم يعظكم به إن الله كان سميعا بصيرا ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة استقيموا اعتدل وساووا صفوفكم فإن تسوية الصفوف من إطفام الصلاة shoulder to shoulder heart with heart الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نسأل اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وإن تبدوا ما في أنفسكم أو تخفوه يحاسبكم به الله فيغفر لمن يشاء ويعذب من يشاء والله على كل شيء قدير آمن الرسول بما أنزل 
إِلَيْهِ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ كُلٌّ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ لَا نُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ أَحَدٍ مِنْ رُسُلِهِ وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا غُفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين لا يكلف الله نفسه إلا وسعها لها ما كسبت وعليها ما اكتسبت ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله